as you heard, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship. I'm actually on sabbatical this year and I'm spending the year at um, the National Science Foundation, which is our national um, investment arm in the US government that focuses on, on funding actually uh, new technology, lab to market technology, thinking about how to bring new startups for the US um, government. So it's, it's been a good year so far. I just got started. And so um, I'm bringing my research that I'm gonna share with you today to uh, the federal government in this way, um, because there is a lot about startups, and as you all know, right, that, um, that are difficult. And one of the primary challenges for startup companies is the acquisition of startup capital, right? How do you get money? And this has been a question for me, as you heard from my background, um, prior to becoming a professor and studying this in the venture capital process, I actually worked in venture capital investing. And before that, I had my own business. So I actually went through the process. I had started a toy store um, in California. And I did that because my parents, my mother had actually started a toy store when I was a child. So I grew up in the business. I knew the business. She actually looked at importing toys from India. And so my family is all in India, as you may have guessed. And so we, um, that was the process by which I experienced what it was like to think about doing a business. So seeing it first as a child, and then I did it on my own and seeing how challenging it was finding funds. And so then I got into funding myself. So I worked in VC, in venture capital, and so I started to see there was a lot about the process that was not as straightforward as people like to imagine or not as quote rational, right? When it comes to decision-making research and thinking about what, what goes into decision-making that leads investors to want to invest in companies. And so that's what I started to look at. And so what I'm gonna share with you today is um, a basically a, a culmination of a lot of studies that I have done. And I'll walk you through um, what the studies are and kind of what the findings are and what are the insights both for startup founders, but also for, um, for both if you're looking for capital, right? What do you need to think about? But also what do you need to think about for your own organization as you understand what some of these biases are that impact um, the financial process? So what, you know, the, the big problem or the big kind of um, aha I have had through my work is that biases influence decision-making and there's a whole swath of research, right, in psychology, um, that, that study this. And I, I've worked with a, a number of these professors that look at biases in decision-making. I've also taught negotiation for a number of years. Um, I worked at the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School and um, worked with a negotiation professor at Harvard Business School. Um, so there's a lot about bias that we know influences decision-making. But what I would like to share with you is that even financial investments um, and the examples that I mentioned I'm going to use are going to be uh, from venture capital decision-making. This happens because we are wired, right, in certain ways. We can't help it. This is our human nature. And such that both, both affinities for things and, you know, biases against things um, will influence decision-making. And we're often unaware that this is what's happening in our, uh, in our, um, in our processes. And so the solution I'm gonna give you the takeaway right now is that you need to have diversity in decision-making roles. You need to have a diversity of thought and perspective in organizations at the kind of the senior levels, at the decision-making levels to really to have a, a, a chance of mitigating these biases. Um, you know, I mentioned that I have studied this in the venture capital process. This is an article that was in um, Harvard Business Review, and it was kind of a, a summation of several of these studies. And the studies I focused on was the pitch process. And as you may have heard, and I'll, I'll share with you this in a moment, but the pitch is an important part of uh, an investor's decision-making um, 
before you fund, right? You, you often have to have a pitch. And so I studied various pitch, um, various settings. And these are the studies that I, I talk about, that I wrote about, um, that I, some of them are published, not all of them, unfortunately. As you know, the research process is a long time. One is actually in the r, &R process right now. Hopefully it will be published soon. Um, but the takeaways are all what I will share with you now. But one of the biggest lessons that I learned both in um, my own work in studying this, but also from working in venture capital prior to becoming a professor is that um, I make the analogy that, that VCs are more like this animal. And I know you're sitting there going this, I thought this was a top a talk about startups and entrepreneurship and investing. And it is, I promise you. But uh, this is, first of all, um, an animal that really gives me the analogy um, of, of what a VC is and what goes into a big part of their decision making. And I'm just, I'm gonna throw this out and feel free to put in the chat. Does anyone know what this animal is? Anyone have any guesses as to what this animal is? I'll give you a hint, it's a rodent. It's in the rodent family. And again, I know we're, we're, uh, we're it's a good, <laughs> exactly. Very good guess, I love that. Um, I should put a wild goose up because it's similar. It's not a rat, it's not a rat, although there have been, that's a good analogy too. Um, a guinea pig, no, it's not a guinea pig. This is, it's beaver, nope, not a beaver. These are good guesses. Hamster, nope, not a hamster. Not cute and cuddly like a hamster is in this country. <laughs> Considered a pet here, it's crazy. Um, no, none of these. Anything, any other guesses? Is it a raccoon? Not a raccoon, nope. A qu I don't know what a quokka is, interesting. I've never heard of a quokka. Um, this is... <laughs> A hedgehog, no, not a hedgehog. These are all good guesses. And I, like I said, I gave you a, a clue in that it is in the rodent family. So these are excellent guesses. And who knew there were this many rodents out there, right? There's, there's a lot of rodents. Um, this is an animal known as a lemming. Have you heard of a lemming before? And the wild goose was another good analogy because the lemming, I use the lemming as the analogy for VCs and how they make decisions um, because of this, what is known for lemmings is summed up in this cartoon here. And what lemmings tend to do is they live in big groups, right? And when one of them gets scared of something or one of them sees something, it starts running. And then the whole pack starts running behind, actually, I don't know if they're called a pack, but let's say it's called a pack. All of the lemmings in the family, in the big group you see, they start running, following this lemming. And even when the lemming runs off a cliff and to its death, so they all follow the first lemming blindly. And this is actually a true story. Here are lemmings, in fact, falling um, off a cliff. And so this has become kind of like the wild goose that we heard uh, from, who said the wild goose? Mamta said the wild goose, right? The wild goose chase. The lemming is similar. One of them will run and they all follow. And so now the expression is, right, like lemmings chasing after something, even when nothing is necessarily there, you think the leader knows what they're doing. And so all the VCs follow. And we see this happen over and over. And in fact, when I worked in venture capital, we used to even hear some of the partners say things like, oh, well, you know, they've invested in aerospace, et cetera. Like we need to be in that. We need to be in cable. We need to be in that, right? Just seeing how, how one, um, individual is is behaving, particularly the leaders, right? The kind of the brand name VCs in the industry, then everyone had to be investing in that space. So you had to get a company in that market. Um, Dodo's exhibit, Venki saying the same herding behavior, very interesting, um, which off, it also perhaps led to their extinction, right? So we do see this happen over and over. And so this is a very commonly known fact about venture capitalists and their behaviors. And I often said, you know, and you will see as you 
may have heard, but I will share with you in this talk, um, almost all VCs in the US and globally are men. And it was astonishing to me because the another analogy I use for VCs is that they often are like women when it comes to purses, right? And so there's a story about uh, this was the most expensive handbag in the world. Um, the, it was a $432,000, it's called a Birkin bag. And this one was made of croc skin, white gold and diamonds. And can you imagine spending $432,000 on a handbag? Well, some people can, right? Um, but this is how women tend to brag about their acquisitions, about their handbags, you know, especially in this country, like, oh, I got this bag at this price. And you hear VCs, the men talk about this very similarly, making early bets in companies like Twitter, right? Chris Saka, he's a guy on the show in the US called Shark Tank. And I know they've made versions of it. There's Dragon's Den in London. And I, I don't know if there's um, a version in India um, you can share with me. But this, you know, invest, entrepreneurs come on the show and these investors, famous sharks, um, will, you know, grill them about their pitches and then ultimately perhaps make an investment. And his, Chris Sackett's claim to fame is that you see on his bio, he's made early bets in companies such as Twitter, Uber, Instagram, Kickstarter, right? And so... Um, oh, so there's an Indian version starting. So you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So this is, a, you know, the idea is the investor makes an angel investment, an early small investment in this company. And really um, only in Hindi. So you can watch the Indian version. There's a lot on YouTube, et cetera, on. So you will be, you can watch it if you want. Um, and now actually a lot of uh, researchers have started using the videos of Dragon's Den and Shark Tank, and they try to write research papers about the pitch decision-making process based on the show, which I think is a big mistake because I've known people that have been on the show. Um, I wrote a case about an entrepreneur who actually went and uh, pitched on Shark Tank that you can watch. Uh, he's got, uh, it's, his company's called iSlide. Anyway, um, it's very produced, right? This is not a real setting. And the real value is in the marketing of being on TV because once you're on TV, I mean, literally the next day, my entrepreneur was telling me, you know, his sales went through the roof. He didn't get invested and the pitch really didn't matter because of how much it's produced. So it's, it's pretty phony, right? It's Hollywood, it's not the real deal. But the point is they brag. Right? Investors love to talk about the deals they got. And so this deal of the handbag, you know, $432,000 sounds like a lot, but when you notice bags can be more than that. So a similar bag, the next version of the Hermes Birkin bag uh, sold for $2 million. So, you know, $432,000 was a steal, right? That bag is worth far more today. And just to put in perspective, um, this was a bag, this was a few years ago. I think that price has been outdone even now, but $3.8 million um, is, you know, is, uh, is possible for bags, right? When we see the stock market values of things. Um, so in a similar vein, this is how investors talk. They talk, they brag about the bargains they got, right? That they were able to invest in this company at this price, at this level, before it became, you know, Facebook or Twitter, et cetera, the huge market cap values. So as I mentioned, one of the big important criteria for any investor is the pitch. And the pitch process um, always confused me. Like, why do you actually need to make, why do we need to have someone come pitch? Well, it turns out that when investors are watching a pitch, they're actually evaluating the person, the entrepreneur during that pitch. And this is a very uh, important part of the decision-making process. In fact, um, almost, I would say zero companies would be funded by investors if without having watched them pitch or having met the person. 
And so you see here the, you know, the funnel process, there's a lot of people that want venture capital funding. They make it through whatever screening process. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of the screening is really about who you know, right? Um, we never looked at, at business plans that came in quote over the transom, right? That just were um, submitted online. Um, it, it came down to, oh, so-and-so suggested this company or another investor, or my neighbor, it didn't matter, but just having that network connection is really critical. And then we would have them come in and pitch. And once they pitched, if we liked what we had read in the business plan and in our market analysis, then we would pursue due diligence and really see if we wanted to make a, an actual investment with the other investors involved. And then perhaps we would invest once it got through due diligence itself. So even if we had really liked a business, right? Without meeting the company, um, we would never have invested. So the pitch is a critical piece of the process for sure. And uh, when I started my PhD study, so I, you know, I, you know, I was an entrepreneur, I had my own business, I started in California, I ran it. And I got to the point where I either needed to grow the business or uh, do something else because I was working with my mother and you can imagine what that's like after a certain point. So I decided to get into funding um, and I worked at first at this mergers and acquisitions investment bank and then I worked in venture capital. And I realized as I worked in these fields about how much was this pitch, right? And how our decision might actually change by watching the pitch. And then I went to business school. I went to MIT for my MBA. And while I was there, this book came out. And this is really one of the reasons why I got into my PhD was this book written by Sandy Pentland. And he's a professor at MIT. He's in the media lab. And the book on a signals is a study of all of these, the media lab does all these kind of interpersonal technologies is the best way to put it. And one of his grad students did this study where they took two groups of venture investors and they asked each group who were separated, which of these ventures do you think are most likely to succeed? Meaning, you know, which in venture would you want to invest in? Right, essentially what you're asking them. And what they did is in room A, this group of investors only had the business plan to read. And in room B, the other group of investors only watched the entrepreneur pitch. So room A, they're only reading. And in room B, they're only listening and watching the entrepreneur pitch. And the, the question was, and I'll ask this to you, you know, do you think these two groups of investors picked the same ventures that they thought would be successful? Com completely different ventures? Or do you think they were somewhat similar? You know, not very different because these are all you know, local experienced investors um, and they're seeing the same businesses essentially. What do you think? And you can just, you can put it in the chat if you want, um, feel free to share. Any, uh, any guesses? So some of you are saying too, that they pick completely different. Some are somewhat similar, not dramatically different. So everyone clear? So in one room, the investors only read the plan and in one room, they are only watching the pitch. Dramatically different. Yeah, it, it turns out, um, and I'm kind of leading you this way, right? Uh, it, they were completely different. The selections were not similar, guys. They were not similar. They were actually completely different. Um, so just by reading the plan, you may have some interest or it sounds good on paper or by watching the entrepreneur pitch led them in a different way, right? Because these are two different decision makers here. So this I thought was a fascinating outcome. And the reason that Sandy Pentland did the study was actually to look, the, the grad student, they had created these devices and they were looking to see how much the individuals connect, meaning how much eye contact do they share during the presentation? How much does the body language, how much are, is the entrepreneur facing each person as they're presenting, things like that. So that was what they were measuring with their technology. 
And what the outcome was, was the entrepreneurs who created more connection with the investors in the room were the ones that were selected. I was more struck that it didn't matter what was written in the plan, right? Or what was attractive in the written document was very different from what was selected when they met the person, which I knew, right? And this was my own personal experience because we would have read a business plan and I would have done the market analysis. We would have liked the market and the what we had read. But then once they came into pitch, we may say, no way, no way are we investing in that person. And so this is what I became very interested in studying. What gets noticed during the pitch? What is the entrepreneur doing that creates this investor connection that the investor is influenced by and is convinced that they want to perhaps invest in this person and in this business? And the analogy that a lot of um, investors use is that when early stage investors invest, they're actually you know, almost getting married, right? And this is a picture of a Western wedding, right? A white wedding dress and the groom um, because early stage investors can't leave. They, once they invest, they are committed to this company. Um, in fact, the only opportunities to exit an early stage investment are really at liquidity moments, things like you know, an IPO or uh, the company gets sold or the company goes out of business, right? And then you lose all your money. But there's no, it's not like buying stock on the stock market where you could invest today in a publicly traded company and then sell your shares if you don't like what the entrepreneur is doing or the way, what the company is doing, you are stuck. And so a better picture, as you've kind of been hearing from my teasers here for um, the investment community is this, right? Uh, men, because um, the field is all men. And I actually heard an investor say um, to, in a conference, he would never invest in a company with an entrepreneur he wouldn't want to go to dinner with. And I was so floored by this comment because at the end of the day, what does it matter if you can go to dinner with the entrepreneur when this is a financial decision, right? You are merely supposedly only looking for ROI and returns to your investors, to your private equity, your LPs, and so on. So what should it matter if you can have a dinner with this person? This sounded so strange and honestly, so much uh, filled with bias that um, this is where I started. And so where I've landed, um, I have several papers, as you've seen, about you know, decision-making and the influence of pitches on um, investor decisions. And these are kind of the sum of some of the studies that are published. And what I'll share with you are some of the findings now, and I'll do this fairly quickly so we can, you can have, ask some questions about um, what have I found, right? What have I found from studying pitches? And so this is a question, um, for you, 